Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Andrew Berman. I'm the executive director of the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. And uh, thank you. And welcome to uh, GVSHP's 35th annual meeting and our 25th Village Award Ceremony. Over the past 25 years, we've had the pleasure of honoring some really wonderful people, places, and institutions with our Village Awards, some of which, sadly, are no longer with us, while others continue to thrive and grow. I'd like to thank our very generous co-hosts for the evening, the New School, with whom we've partnered on this and so many events throughout the year, to our wonderful awards committee, including co-chairs Judith Stonehill and Tom Burchard, for their terrific work in selecting this year's honorees from hundreds of worthy nominations. I'd also like to thank GVSHP's incredibly hardworking staff, and for those that are in the room, I'll ask them to just wave, although most of them I think are outside um, uh, still working. Sam Moskowitz, Ted Mino, Karen Lowe, Amanda Davis, and two new staff members, Lauren Snedeker and Matthew Morowitz. I'd also like to extend a special acknowledgement to all the GVSHP trustees who are here tonight, whose generosity with their time and talent make what we do possible. If all of the trustees are he who are here could just uh, raise their hands or stand up so they could be acknowledged. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank our wonderful and incredibly talented photographer, Bob Estramera. And I want to uh, particularly note and uh, welcome uh, the presence of City Council Member Corey Johnson, who's here with us tonight, uh, with whom we work closely on so many issues and also note that uh, State Senator Brad Hoylman is represented uh, by several members of his staff here tonight as well. But before we get to our awards program and our election of trustees, it's my distinct pleasure to provide you with a review of GVSHP's activities and accomplishments over the past year. In May, GVSHP staged its major annual benefit, our highly anticipated spring house tour. This year's tour was blessed with beautiful weather and was our highest grossing benefit ever. Hundreds of tour goers got exclusive access to some of the most striking and appealing private homes in the village, the doors of which were generously opened for the afternoon by their owners. The event raised nearly a quarter of GVSHP's annual budget and was made possible by an incredibly hardworking committee, including longtime outgoing co-chair Leslie Mason and more than 130 volunteers and a dozen generous businesses. This was just one of many forms of support GVSHP received over the past year. Membership support, which comprises about 70% of our annual income, rose by over 30% over the past year. Over the past dozen years, the number of our members has grown by 250%, while membership support has increased by almost 700%. New members come to GVSHP through a variety of means, one of which is our ever-changing and expanding programming. This past year, GVSHP conducted 57 public programs attended by nearly 4,000 people, an almost 25% increase over last year's already impressive numbers. Almost all of our programs are free and with the exception of our members-only events, open to the public. These ranged from programs explaining how to research the history of your building to the origins of the Whitney Museum in Greenwich Village. From a tour of East Village Community Gardens to a remembrance of West 14th Street's Little Spain District. We held panel discussions about restaurant preservation and one-on-one -on -one conversations about the state of historic preservation. We looked at the incredible historic photos of Robert Otter and Fred McDara and the red-tailed the red -tailed hawks of Washington and Tompkins, Tompkins Squares. We also did wonderful programs with food critic and writer Mimi Sheridan and artist Frederick Broson, both contributors to our book, Greenwich Village Stories, which is available for sale here tonight. We also continued our highly popular historic plaque program in partnership with the Two Boots Foundation. This past October, we added a plaque to the front of the former Fillmore East on 2nd Avenue, 
where we were joined by musician Lenny Kay and by Joshua White, the man behind the Fillmore's legendary Joshua Light Show. Tomorrow night at 6 p.m. we'll be adding a plaque to the site of Martha Graham's dance studio for, of the 1930s and 1940s at 13th Street and 5th Avenue, also in a new school building. And plans are in the works for a plaque marking James Baldwin's former residence on Horatio Street in the fall. Meanwhile, with the help of the GVSHP broker partnership, we expanded our continuing edu education program for real estate professionals. Through this program, we educate brokers and realtors about the history of our communities and the value of preservation. Given the critical role these professionals play in shaping our neighborhood, this education plays invaluable dividends. The partnership also staged a very successful comedy night fundraiser for GVSHP in March, which also raised funds towards a scholarship named for former partnership co-chair Rebecca Ritter Daniels, who we lost quite suddenly earlier this year. Over the past year, demand for GVSHP's children's education program surged as more schools from across the five boroughs enrolled in the program which serves children in grades one through seven using in-class sessions and a tour of the village to teach about immigrant history, urban development, and 19th century life in New York. Nearly half of the students who enrolled in the program qualified for need-based scholarships from GVSHP, allowing them to participate for free. Our children's education program, like our general programming, is made possible by a combination of government and private grants, but the single largest source of support for these pro programs is contributions from our members. GVSHP has also been expanding our social media presence to engage and mobilize a broader audience. In the past year, our Facebook reach has grown by 20%, our Twitter following has grown by 30%, and the viewership of our YouTube page has grown an astonishing two and a half times. The last especially is no surprise. You can now view a video of almost every GVSHP, almost every program GVSHP conducts on our YouTube page, as well as videos of Landmarks Preservation Commission's hearings on items in our neighborhood. So if you missed one of our lectures or panels, or you want to find out exactly why the LPC approved an addition on your block, our YouTube page is the place to go. Meanwhile, our website continues to attract users from across the globe. In the past year, it drew nearly 400,000 page views from almost 300,000 unique visitors, while our blog, Off the Grid, received 212,000 page views from 178,000 unique visitors. Since its start in 2011, our most popular blog post has now received nearly 40,000 page views. Our online presence has also been a great tool for ho helping local residents learn about what's going on every day in our neighborhoods and how to get involved. Our Landmarks application webpage is the first of its kind in the city, providing invaluable information about every single public hearing application for a change to a landmark building in our neighborhoods. It provides the history of the building, the proposed changes, when and where the application will be heard by the Community Board and the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and how you can give in-person, emailed, or written testimony before a decision is made. It tracks the application in some cases for years from its first filing to its resolution, letting you know of any modifications to the application, new meetings that have been scheduled or decisions rendered, and allows you to sign up for alerts to update you on all such developments. In the last year, this webpage received over 22,000 page views from more than 16,000 visitors, making this an incredibly valuable and widely used resource. Of course, we don't just let the public know about these applications. GVSHP carefully reviews every one of them ourselves and when appropriate, issues alerts to our members and advocates to the Community Board and the Landmarks Preservation Commission for what we believe is the right outcome. In the past year, our Preservation Committee reviewed 93 such Landmarks applications in nearly every corner of our neighborhood, ranging from store storefront alterations to demolitions and new construction. Our input and that of the public which we helped facilitate clearly impacted the outcome of many of these applications. And on a daily basis, GVSHP monitors every single one of the over 6,500 buildings in our neighborhood for any new demolition or construction permits so we can be sure to take swift action in response if needed. 
Landmark's applications were not the only place where GVSHP was able to have an impact over the past year. In late 2014, the Landmark's Preservation Commission put forward a plan to decalendar or drop from consideration about 100 potential landmarks throughout the five boroughs, including four in our neighborhood. GVSHP and our fellow preservationists quickly rallied against the plan and called for alternative means for the city to address its backlog of sites awaiting a final determination on landmark designation. Soon after, the city dropped its plan. Not yet dropped is the city's plan for a citywide rezoning change, which would increase the allowable height of new development in residential neighborhoods, especially those in contextual districts, areas with special restrictions meant to preserve the scale and character of our neighborhoods. GVSHP fought hard to secure such rules in the far west and east village, but the city's plan would increase the allowable height limits in those areas by anywhere from just under 10% to over 31%. Though a citywide issue, I'm proud to say that GVSHP has led the charge against this plan, and in May, the city pulled back somewhat on the proposal, but not enough. Most of the proposed height limit increases remain in place, and as this plan goes through the public hearing and review process this fall, before the community boards, borough presidents, and city council, GVSHP will be there to fight hard to maintain our zoning protections. In fact, GVSHP is fighting to expand such zoning protections in places like the South Village and the University Place Broadway corridors. In each, current zoning allows the construction of towers 300 feet in height or greater. And sadly, this is no longer just a theoretical threat. A developer has filed plans for a 308 foot tall tower on the site of Bowlemore Lanes at University Place and 12th Street and the planned development could actually get even larger. GVSHP has submitted proposals for new zoning with more appropriate height limits for both of these areas, which have garnered strong support from, local, from the local community and elected officials. However, the city must approve any such rezoning and has thus far been non-committal on both. So we are working with local elected officials to increase the pressure and get the city to act. And by the way, thank you, Corey, for all the great work you've done in that regard. Over the last year, we've seen a few notable examples where the city has been willing to act, in some cases after considerable waits. Late last year, the city landmarked the 1866 Town and Village Synagogue on East 14th Street, a building which had been calendared or under consideration for landmark designation since 1966. GVSHP spearheaded the su successful campaign to get the city to finally designate after it came to light that the site was being marketed for sale and possible development. And just earlier this month, the city finally agreed to consider a proposal put forward by GVSHP to individually landmark the West Village's Stonewall Inn, internationally recognized as the birthplace of the modern gay and lesbian civil rights movement. Though given historic district Though given historic designation by the state of New York and federal government back in 1999, also in response to GVSHP and others, the city has been slow to move. Since only city landmarking, not state or federal designation, actually preserves a building, GVSHP pushed hard to get the new administration to move on Stonewall. And we've also put forward three other sites in our neighborhood connected to this important civil rights movement for consideration for landmark designation. Stonewall's hearing before the Landmarks Preservation Commission will take place next Tuesday. Just two weeks ago, another important hearing for the future of our neighborhood took place in the Court of Appeals in Albany, uh, where the state's highest court heard GVSHP and our co-plaintiff's lawsuit challenging the city's approval of the massive 20-year, 2 million square foot NYU expansion plan. We were elated in early 2014 when a state Supreme Court justice agreed with our suit and struck down an important component of the plan. But we were disappointed when the de Blasio administration joined NYU in appealing the decision, which was then overturned. The Court of Appeals could have let that decision stand, but instead chose to hear our appeal, which was supported by a broad array of civic, parks, and good government groups, and a bipartisan coalition of state legislators. A decision is expected as early as July. 
we will likely be waiting longer for a decision regarding the sale of air rights from the Hudson River Park. This scheme was intended to generate money for completion of the park, albeit at the expense of allowing larger development on adjacent inland blocks. We did score a big victory last fall when Governor Cuomo dropped a plan to allow such sales without their going through the city's public review process. But the potential for millions of square feet of additional development being added to our neighborhoods remains, and GVSHP continues to closely monitor the situation and push for alternatives to upzonings as a means to fund the park. We're also closely monitoring any plans for Cobble Court, the beloved former farmhouse and home of Goodnight Moon author Margaret Wise Brown at 121 Charles Street at Greenwich Street. Last year, the house was advertised for sale at an exorbitant price descri and described as a potential, quote, blank canvas for development, unquote, in spite of the fact that it's located within the Greenwich Village Historic District. This set off alarm bells that a new owner might seek permission from the Landmarks Preservation Commission to demolish or move the house, which has been altered over time and was moved to, to this location from Yorkville in 1967. While any such application is currently only theoretical, GVSHP took no chances and quickly compiled exhaustive documentation of the history of the house and its very intentional move to this site in the West Village, including interviews with the former owner. This will give us irrefutable evidence of Cobble Court's historic significance and its connection to this site should it ever be needed in response to an application for demolition, removal, or radical alteration of the house. <laughs> GVSHP also looked to the future by issuing a report calling for the Landmarks Preservation Commission to better protect properties and neighborhoods under consideration for landmark designation. GVSHP documented how too early extra legal notification of certain owners and slow action by the commission has in too many cases allowed unscrupulous developers to alter or demolish properties being considered for landmark designation. Sadly, this has included works by Frank Lloyd Wright and Morris Lapidus and many buildings in our neighborhoods. We, recommend, we recommended and are pushing for a series of reforms to the system to prevent more such losses from ever taking place. And in March, GVSHP issued another report documenting the Real Estate Board of New York's pivotal role in blocking affordable housing measures. GVSH put, GVSHP took this unusual step in response to Rebney's attempts to undermine preservation protections by claiming that such protections undercut the affordability of housing in New York City. Distributed to every media outlet and every elected official in New York City, the report and accompanying op-ed sought to redirect the conversation about our city's affordability crisis away from Rebney's self-serving narrative and towards a real examination of the challenges we face. This effort was also aided by a standing room only panel discussion GVSHP held in September with government leaders, affordable housing advocates, and leading academics about the true relationship between affordability and preservation. Affordability also intersected with GVSHP's agenda around small business preservation, a growing issue in which the society has taken an increasingly active role. We joined the campaign in support of the Small Business Job Survival Act, a bill before the city council which would give small businesses a fairer shot at negotiating leases they can afford. And we launched our Business of the Month program, which harnesses our email list, blog, and social media to highlight, celebrate, and encourage the patronage of beloved small businesses in our neighborhood. We've received hundreds of nominations from the public and encourage all of you to submit more and to share each business of the month with your friends and neighbors. In fact, June's business of the month, Cobblestone Vintage Clothing, was just chosen and appeared today. So as you can see, it's been a very busy year for GVSHP, and we have much to do in the year ahead. But even in these incredibly challenging times, facing opponents with exponentially greater resources than we have, you, our members, have enabled us to accomplish so much. It's your support and participation which ensures that preservation continues to have a strong voice in our neighborhood and our city. Thank you for all you do to make what we do possible.
So I hope you'll stay with me to enjoy the rest of this wonderful evening and stay with GVSHP as we work hard to preserve and protect our neighborhood in the coming year. Thank you. I would now like to ask Justine Leguizamo, the co-chair of our nominating committee, to come up. GVSHP's nominating committee is entrusted with the task of searching out new members for our board of trustees and confirming the continued engagement of current trustees whose term is due for renewal. It is now with great pleasure that I present the slate of trustees recommended by GVSHP's nominating committee to be voted on by all GVSHP members this evening. All dues-paying members received a bookmark when you entered to indicate your vote. When I call for the vote, please raise your voting bookmark in the air. I present to you the slate of trustees renewing for a three-year term. These candidates have already been serving on the board and are renewing their candidacy. Please stand when I say your name. Marianne Arisman, Tom Burchard, Arthur Levin, Judith Stonehill, Linda Yoel. All in favor of this slate? Against? The slate is approved. <laughs> Next, I am pleased to present two new candidates for a three-year term for the GVSHP board. Tom Cooper is the chair of GVSHP's broker partnership and a member of the GVSHP benefit committee. He is currently a real estate broker with the Corcoran Group and volunteers for the 300 West 23rd Street Know Your Neighbor Committee. Trevor Stewart is a member of GVSHP's Preservation Committee. He is the co-founder and chair of Protect the Village Historic District. He is a published author, CPA, and PhD. A 33-year village resident, he is a retired Deloitte partner and currently works as a consultant and as a senior research fellow at the Rutgers Business School. All in favor of this slate? Against? The slate is approved. Thank you. So it is now my distinct honor to introduce a man who really needs no introduction, um, author, humorist, villager, and GBSHP Board of Advisors member, Calvin Trillin, who will present the 2015 Village Awards. Thank you, Andrew. It's nice to be back here. It's nice to be uh, back in this uh, beautiful auditorium and confirm that it hasn't been uh, turned into a Ralph Lauren store while I was gone. <laughs> Uh, I've lived in the village for many decades. Actually, I now live in the West Village. Uh, my house has not moved. Uh, 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 the real estate people decided I live in the West Village, um, which is uh, the most uh, Ralph Laurenized section of the village uh, at this point. Um, uh, and we've seen some stores that actually serve the neighborhood leave, including uh, Joe's Dairy, um, which I uh, did a piece on when it closed, and which I pre uh, won one of these awards several years ago. Uh, in that piece, I, I talked about the departure of a number of stores like that, and I, uh, I said, just as in France, they say, cherchez la femme, um, here we say, look for the real estate angle, um, if something like that happens. Um, the, um, one of the places that actually served the neighborhood uh, in a couple of blocks from me left this year was replaced by a clothing store uh, paying what I was told was $23,000 a month rent. Um, and I noticed a crowd there when I was coming home from the subway 
one day, and people were taking pictures with their iPhones, and it turned out that on one of the displays, quite an attractive display holding what I suppose the store called its shirtings or something like that, uh, was a large rat jumping up and down. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes pawing at the window, sometimes jumping from one display to the other. Uh, my grandsons and I call it the rat store now. Uh, I always go by just to see if he's there. Um, um, but I think the real estate angle is uh, noticeable now on the High Line, which the last time I went on seems to be getting enclosed by huge buildings uh, called the High Line Towers and the special High Line Access condominiums, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to the point where eventually uh, I think it's going to be called the High Tunnel. Uh, um, but there are some good aspects of that. There was a store, a nice corner store in my neighborhood that uh, had coffee in the New York Times and that sort of thing. And um, they were forced out and a store started there that when they put up the sign, I don't know if it was the name of the store or what their specialty was, but it was tiramisu. Um, it's a line from Sleepless in Seattle where Rob Reiner tells Tom Hanks that he has to get used to dating and there's a lot of new things since the last time he dated and he needs to know the word tiramisu. Uh, so I was, I sort of was disappointed at that. I thought this useful story had been replaced by a punchline. Um, but on the other hand, there had been usually a little nod of kind of rough looking guys who stood on that corner and they weren't going to stand in front of a store that said tiramisu and uh, I mean their their street cred would have been evaporated very quickly um, so they left and and soon enough of course the tiramisu store left also uh, but the rough guys didn't come back I think the aroma of tiramisu is still hanging over that corner. Um, so we've seen a lot of that kind of development in the West Village. And, and I read in the Times a couple of weeks ago that the Whitney Museum um, is, is going to turn the West Village into the new Upper East Side. And I thought, gee, thanks. That's, <laughs> that's really what we wanted. Um, I'm reminded of something I've probably said it before, but Kenny Shopson, a rather eccentric restaurant man who was a couple of blocks from me for many years on Bedford Street, um, I asked him what the difference between the village and uptown was, and he thought for a minute and he said, I don't know, I've never been uptown. <laughs> uh, so tonight we honor people who um, uh, who make the Greenwich, Greenwich Village a village. Um, we're honoring a renowned local artisan, a businesswoman and community activist, a village resident who founded a transformative organization, an inspiring art institution, an impeccable and completely voluntary restoration, and a couple whose outstanding efforts in documenting a generation of small businesses and the stories behind them have brought much needed attention to the plight facing New York City's businesses, uh, small businesses. I suppose they've seen the real estate angle a lot. Here are our awards. Visiting Barbara Shum's sandal shop on East 4th Street is like taking a marvelous journey back in time to the 60s when both the East and West Village had countless leather shops where handcrafted items were made. Barbara is now one of the last of these artisans left. After apprenticing with the New York City scandal, sandal maker in 1950s, Barbara opened her first sandal shop in 1962 on East 7th, moving to her current location on East 4th Street in the early 1980s. This near legendary cobbler is an artist as much as an artisan. She's also been an activist first woman to enter McSorley's when a 1970 ruling legally forced this alehouse to admit females. That took a lot of guts, as many of you remember. Their motto was, be good or be gone, we were here before you were born. 
Um, she, I am classical and simple when it comes to my sandals, Barbara notes. I don't put a lot of doodads on them. It takes two or three weeks for a pair of sandals to be made. This begins with the tracing of a person's foot from which a pattern is drawn and includes a fitting partway through the process. GVSHP is proud to recognize and honor Barbara Shom for her contributions to the quality of life in the village for over 50 years through her creativity and her determination to keep her small business alive and thriving. We give here this village award as a renowned local artisan, keeping alive a handmade craft which once flourished in our neighborhoods and of which she is one of the few remaining practitioners. Accepting the award is Barbara Shom. Bonnie Slotnick began her career as an artist, then worked for a cookbook publisher and as a book scout for a well-known uptown bookstore, Kitchen Arts and Letters, uh, on West 10th Street residence since 1976. Bonnie is vocal at community board meetings about the importance of maintaining the village for residents as well as tourists and businesses, and the importance of supporting independent businesses of all kind. She is devoted to the village east and west. Her bookstore was located on West 10th Street for 15 years until she lost her lease. Then she was unexpectedly offered a new space on East 2nd Street. When discussing the nomination, Bonnie said that those who really deserve the award are her landlords, siblings Margot and Gareth Johnston's. Johnston. The Johnstons learned about Bonnie's search for a new home from the blog Jeremiah's Vanishing New York. The Johnsons felt they must save the village treasure, and they offered Bonnie a lease that suited the needs of both landlord and tenant. Her new space is three times larger than the old space. I take back everything I said about the real estate industry. <laughs> if the story seems magical, so does the bookstore, which specializes in antiquarian and out-of-print books on food, beverages, etiquette, entertaining, and housekeeping. Vintage kitchenware and antique dining pieces are artfully tucked in among the books. The shelves are wonderfully organized. There are books on various ethnic cuisines, such as French, African, Jewish, Latin, Chinese, and Irish. Books from different U.S. regions, such as New England, the South, and the Midwest. I hope you have a hamburger hot dish there in the Midwest. Um, recipe books for breakfast, chocolate herbs and spices, vegetarian, dairy, food preserving and canning an appetizer. Guidebooks on restaurants and fine dining can also be found. MFK Fisher has a shelf of her own and many other legendary food writers and chefs publications are represented, including Craig Claiborne, Julia Child, Marion Cunningham, Edna Lewis, James Beard, and Pierre Frenet. The bookstore opens onto a garden where you can sit and decide which books you want to take. Bonnie Slotnick is awarded a Village Award for her dedication to the community as an independent businesswoman and community activist, surviving an eviction and thriving in a new home where she continues to offer an outstanding assortment of cookbooks and other culinary items. Bonnie Slotnick. Say something. 
The last time I received something on this stage was almost exactly 40 years ago when I got my BFA from Parsons. And although I never used my training in fashion illustration, uh, that brought me to the village, and I'm so happy that I've spent the better part of my life here. There were dozens, if not hundreds, of bookstores in this neighborhood when I moved here. Almost all of them are gone, but in those bookstores, I really fell in love with the neighborhood and with books. And I thought that my store would be just as gone as all of those when my landlord told me in October that under no circumstances would he renew my lease. He wouldn't even speak to me. And the people who have saved me, Margot and Garth Johnston, are here today. They are, they are East Villagers, born and bred. They love books. They love bookstores. And I would love for them to stand up and for you to show them what that means to all of us. David Rothenberg has lived in the village since the 60s, first at Sheridan Square across the, from the Stonewall Inn where he witnessed the riots, and for the past few decades on West 13th Street. David began his career in the theater as a producer and publicist for many memorable on and off Broadway productions. In 1966, David was deeply affected after reading a play called Fortune in Men's Eyes, which revealed the harsh realities of the prison system and was written by a former incarcerated playwright named John Herbert. David took a huge risk and put his own savings into producing this controversial play. It was out of that play, originally performed in the Actors Playhouse in Greenwich Village in 1967, that David founded the Fortune Society. The Fortune Society is a hugely successful nonprofit organization that has for almost 50 years advocated for the rights of prisoners and supported successful reentry from prison. Initially, David saw the Fortune Society primarily as an advocacy group. Over time, the Fortune Society grew to include a variety of programs for people leaving prison and reentering society. The Fortune News remains one of the most important newsletters for the currently and formerly incarcerated population, and it is still distributed to thousands of people in prisons twice per year. In 2002, the Fortune Society opened its first housing facility in West Harlem, called the Fortune Academy, known as the Castle, for its Gothic architecture, offering 60 emergency and transitional beds to formerly incarcerated men and women. In 2008, after the building had been providing housing for just over five years, David Rothenberg produced another groundbreaking play, The Castle, which played off-Broadway for over a year. David has helped thousands of people rehabilitate their lives and influence countless more to more empathy for those in this position. Through his advocacy for prison reform, he gives people hope, support, and the space to turn their lives around when they often do not have, some, do they not have someone caring to guide them. David's trailblazing activism has not limited the Fortune Society. In 1985, he became one of the first openly gay people to run for public office in New York City. Although he lost his citizen council race, his strong campaign winning 46% of the vote became a source of inspiration for many who followed in his path. Five years later, De Deborah Glick was elected to the State Assembly from Greenwich Village. And since that time, more than a dozen openly gay people have been elected to the City Council, State Assembly, and State Senate from New York City. David has won dozens of awards and recognitions. Most recently, on April 16, 2015, David and leaders of the Fortune Society accepted the 2015 Morton Deutsch Award for Distinguished Contributions to Social Justice from Columbia University Teachers College. GVSHP is honored to present David Rothenberg with a Village Award, a village resident who founded a transformative organization which has improved the lives of countless individuals who might otherwise have been ignored or overlooked and who blazed a path of activism and political engagement in Greenwich Village. David Rothenberg. Thank you.
true. Uh, David mentions that I did not mention that he was the press agent for uh, what my girls call a one ham show I did at the American Place Theater. <laughs> and either David filled the house or the fact that there were only 99 seats uh, and it got out early so you could get a cab filled the house. One or another, one reason or another, the house was filled. It was, I'm sure, partly David's doing. So I'm particularly pleased to give him this award. We had fun. And we did have fun, yes. You in this picture? No, you're in the picture with Andrew. Can you give a speech? Of course. It, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to get the award, uh, but it's also comforting to know that I'll be historically preserved. <laughs> uh, family legend has it when I was four years old and we were living in Richfield Park, New Jersey, that my family took me into the city and as we walked around the village, I said, thank God there's something else. And have you been to Richfield Park? <laughs> <clears throat> and when I got out of the army, I moved to the village. And uh, I've, I was fascinated listening, uh, seeing the pictures of things that were gone. There were so many institutions, and every one, they said it's the end of an era when the woman's house of detention closed, when Sutter's, Jean V, Balducci's, and uh, Jefferson Market, and the Bagel, and God help us all when St. Vincent's Hospital closed. But you know what happens in the village? There's always something new that brings life. And so I, while I'm in despair when we lose something, I'm always hopeful for the, for the next thing that's going to come and make us all excited. Probably the most important building for me historically was the uh, Actors Playhouse, no longer there at 100 uh, 7th Avenue South, where we did the play Fortune in Men's Eyes. And I, on a um, November night in 67, having met several men and later women, but at the beginning just men who had been incarcerated, and we had these forums after the play, uh, I realized that the, those that were able to stay out and to, to make it out here were mostly people in AA, and they had a program, they had a place that they could go to and talk, but they hadn't dealt with their rage about the prison experience. And from those informal gatherings, I thought we could change the world by informing the public and having an advocacy group. And we called it a Fortune Society from the play's title. And because you're villagers, you all know that's from a sonnet by Shakespeare. One in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone be weep my outcast state. There'll be a quiz afterwards and you'll be asked to know that. And 16 people gave me $2 and we opened an account at Chemical Bank, which doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> and we mimeographed a newsletter. And uh, because I was a good publicist, arranged for the first four formerly incarcerated men to go on a television program, the David Suskind program, which no longer exists. Uh, if you're under 40, it's the precursor to Oprah. Uh, <laughs> And we became a service organization because hundreds of men who saw that television program came to my little theater office and, and we responded <clears throat> to their needs, which are exactly the same today, 47 years later. People who have been incarcerated coming out, looking for something different in their lives. And we have a school and we have counseling and the wonderful residence that in Harlem, the castle, which you saw about. And it's been my privilege to watch people change their lives, to reclaim their lives. And there's nothing more exciting than to, than to see the spirit and, and the, uh, that people who have been written off can come back. And if you're really interested in fighting crime, the real way to fight crime is not more cops on the street because somebody who's angry and alienated and doesn't have a job and can't fit in is gonna find a way to commit a crime, to do something to survive. And so I've been privileged to be a part of an organization of men and women who have altered their lives, and, that, and, and I'm so proud of that part of my life. 
And before I go, I want to do a quick commercial because you're all activists. I've been, act I've been a volunteer in the last year for the uh, Church of the Village, which has a food kitchen, and they feed people twice, twice a week. And we started a drive called uh, Pennies from Heaven just because they need money to get the food, and we raised about $3,000 in pennies. And this Saturday, we're going to set up a table in front of the church so all of you activists who keep pennies in your paper... You know, I know you all keep pennies, and you don't know what you're going to do with them someday. Now I have a, a, a direction for you. You can take those pennies and bring them between 2 and 5 o'clock on Saturday to the Church of the Village at 13th and 7th Avenue because people who are hungry, and it's, there is a solution to hunger in this country and why it's taking so long, but we can all be a part of it. And I w must tell you that when I went first there to volunteer, the cook came running out of the kitchen. He was an alumni from the castle of the Fortune Society. And I said to him, Leroy, why are you here? And he said, because I have to give back now. You all gave me something, and I'm giving back now. Thank you very much for letting me be a part of this. <laughs> Longer than Dear Dawson's acceptance speech when she won for Mrs. Miller. <laughs> I banked at that bank. Um, I think it started Manufacturers Hanover, then became Chemical, then became Chase, then became J.P. Morgan Chase. And I wrote a poem called, A Bank Has Swallowed Up the Bank That Swallowed Up My Bank. Uh, you may have visited our next awardee on this GVA, GVSHP house tour. If you missed it, don't worry, because it's open to the public. We are pleased to recognize what is rightfully being called one of the little art tr treasures of New York by the Wall Street Journal, the Rene and Chaim Gross Foundation. Sculptor Chaim Gross and his wife Rene purchased 526 LaGuardia Place in 1963. Gross long had his studio in Greenwich Village at 63 East 9th Street, but with the acquisition of the new building, an 1830s townhouse adapted to industrial loft style usage. Gross incorporated his living and workplace in one structure. Gross designed the ground floor studio himself and it now holds a permanent installation of his major wood and marble sculpture created over 60 years. The second floor houses a temporary exhibition space as well as a library and archive. The third floor remains a living area featuring an installation of Gross's American, European, African, and pre-Columbian art collections. The public is given access to their incredible collections of close to 10,000 items, including Gross's sculptures and drawings and objects from his collection of African and modern American art, featuring works by artists such as de Kooning, Chagall, Picasso, and Raphael and Moses Sawyer. The Foundation's mission is to encourage artists and the community to actively engage with the artworks and archive and to learn about Gross, his contemporaries, and the history of American art. In addition to permanent collections, the Foundation holds events open to the public, such as recent lectures on direct carving in American art and the world of modern art, artists as writers. The Foundation more than merits recognition and support for its contribution to the Greenwich Village community and its artistic heritage. And GVSHP is proud to recognize an inspiring institution which has preserved and made available to the public an unparalleled collection of paintings, sculptures, and photography that speaks to the incredible, inspiring artistic tradition of Greenwich Village. Accepting the award is Susan Fisher, the Foundation's Executive Director, and Mimi Gross, Chaim and Renee Gross's daughter, an artist in her own right, and the president of the Foundation's Board of Directors.
of course, a fantastic honor. And as a, a kid in the village, I did get my sandals, my first sandals. <laughs> and we definitely caroused all the bookstores on Fourth Avenue, which there were hundreds looking for old National Geographic magazines for school reports. But um, my father had several studios in the village the, for over 25 years on 9th Street and then on Horatio Street, which he loved, but the rent went, the escalated enormously. And then he moved, he was on 12th Street and then on Grand Street and finally found a home and a permanent studio on LaGuardia Place and I hope you'll all come and visit. He, he would have been beyond proud of this moment. It was really his, his dream that was based on little museums in Europe that are dedicated to an artist's life and work, and that's what we made here. Thank you. I just want to quickly um, say on behalf of myself and our wonderful foundation staff who is here tonight, Sasha Davis and Joyce Green, um, thank you so much to the Society and to Andrew Berman for your support of us. Um, I've really enjoyed getting to know the GBSHP staff and I really want to thank Ted Minot who has been such an enthusiastic supporter of us and of our events. Um, Amanda Davis, Drew Derniak, and Sam Moskowitz, thank you. Um, thank you, Justine Leguzamo, Leguzamo um, for your amazing support of us. Uh, I really enjoyed your visit to us, and it really um, excited me to look, look forward to the future. And I also want to thank Sophie McNally and the entire awards committee. And finally, I want to say a huge thanks to Judith Stonehill, who I was so lucky to meet in early 2013 when Mimi wrote a piece for her Greenwich Village Stories, which is a beautiful book. Judith, we are truly lucky to have your support and encouragement. Um, we are dedicated to you, our community, and are incredibly excited to continue to educate and inspire our visitors through Hyam's home, his studio, and collection. If you haven't come down, please come visit us down on LaGuardia Place. Thank you. GVSP, GVSHP is thrilled to present a 2015 Village Award for the restoration of 201 East 12th Street to the Manicharian brothers, the owners of the property, and Thomas Fenneman, Christopher Rome, and Carl Vinge, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, of Thomas A. Fenneman, architect. The restoration of 201 East 12th Street on the corner of 3rd Avenue was a phenomenal restoration of two prominent buildings which had seen better days. The restoration brought the building back to an incredible and historically accurate condition. The project started out as routine repair but the discovery of historic photographs by the project team encouraged the owner to dramatically increase the scope of the work. The owner's commitment to continued stewardship of the property and their desire to contribute to the neighborhood led to a comprehensive restoration to transform the building from a shadow of their former selves to a true gem. This photo shows what the building historically looked like. This photo shows what the building looked like prior to the restoration. Note the missing cornices. The architects designed a meticulous restoration. The restoration work on 201 East 12th Street was completely voluntary, as these are non-landmark buildings. While such restorations are commonplace in historic districts, here the project was geared only toward improving the aesthetics as well as the long-term value and durability of the building. This is a post-restoration photo. At the corner building, terracotta quans were repl replicated to match the existing in dimension and color to continue the strong corners of the entire height of the facade. Keystones and voussoir, says it rhymes with bizarre. Voussoir, uh, were, f were fabricated and installed at the window heads based on the arrangement of the floor below. 
the project team selected brick and mortar colors through a series of mock-ups. The cornice was replicated through careful examination of historic photographs. The project team determined that the original cornice was intended to mimic limestone in color, and accordingly the replica was fabricated to match. In consideration of its time period and character, the old townhouse building was given a different treatment. The new brick dentil design at the top floor window heads was adapted from the lower floors through a series of mock-ups. The townhouse building received a deep brown cornice with an alternating double single bracket rhythm informed by the character of painted wooden cornices typical of the side streets in the East Village. These strategies help complement yet further differentiate the styles of the two buildings. Accepting the award are the project architects Thomas Fenneman and Christopher Rome and property owner Jeffrey Manicharian for an impeccable and completely voluntary restoration of the cornices and facades of two historic buildings, returning them to their past glory. Mr. Trillin spoke very well about much of what I wanted to say, and it was very helpful. But I really do want to thank our architects, especially Chris, who was the lead architect on this. Um, the one who wasn't mentioned uh, was Glenn Kapazuzian of uh, Glacia Contracting, who did the actual work. Um, you should know that this took place this winter, and it was tough. When I would go to this job, I would die to get inside, and these guys were outside all the time. I really, really owe it to them. Um, there, were, there were good parts to this, to this um, you know, what, what did we have to do? We had to do what was absolutely necessary. There were leaks in the building, so there was an absolutely necessary element of this job. We had to repair the leaks. The restoration of the cornice was something that was suggested by the architects, and it was something that was argued among the partners for a very long time. It finally came down to a vote, and it was a unanimous vote. It was, let's beautify the building, let's beautify the neighborhood. Um, the negative part, of course, was it was a big outlay, outlay of a large amount of money for a major capital improvement with with really no return. Now, 201 East 12th Street is a 120 unit, six story elevator building. It was gut renovated in 1979, and it's been a very stable building. There's been very few vacancies over the years, and it's mainly because I believe a wonderful architectural team uh, of, our, of architects, uh, Peter Mullen and Richard Palandrani, designed fabulous apartments. The building today is approximately 85% market rate. It has a very healthy bottom line. If it didn't, this project would not have taken place. That's just for sure. Now you can boo and hiss if you like. I know who I'm talking to. It's ironic that today in Albany, the mayor's agenda calls for, in small part, the recontrol of all apartments in New York City. Any investment in major capital improvements would result in an increase in rent only until it was paid back, and then the rent would be rolled back. Any individual apartment improvement would increase, and then it would be paid back in 40 or 60 months. That's, that is really some investment. It's like investing in a dead racehorse. Complete idiocy. I don't know where the guy came from, but you guys should be very careful what you wish for. Thank you very much.
Regina Kellerman was GVS HP's first executive director. She was an architectural historian and extremely passionate about preservation. Her work laid the foundation for the designation of several New York historic districts. We honor her each year by awarding a village award for a significant contribution to the field of preservation. The winners of the 2015 Regina Kellerman Award for Outstanding Preservation and our final awardees for the evening are James and Carla Murray. The Murrays are an extraordinary artist, are extraordinary artists, photographers, historians, small business advocates, and preservationists. East Village residents for over 20 years, the Murrays started out photographing graffiti, yet the signage on a nearby store caught their eye, so they began taking pictures of those old classic signs in the village. They were soon documenting storefronts, befriending the owners and learning about their stores. These storefronts and stores disappear on what seems like a daily basis. What began as a personal interest in documenting disappearing local businesses has turned into two published book, books and a third, 10 years later, book now in the works. The Murrays have formed lasting personal relationships with business owners and of many fabulous stories to share. Their commitment to preservation extends beyond the village. They live true to their philosophy of supporting small local businesses by shopping locally and sticking mainly to a daily wardrobe plucked from their vast t-shirt collection, sporting the logos of area businesses. Much to the chagrin of their book publisher, they turned down a signing at Barnes and Nobles in favor of doing book signings at several independent bookstores instead. As photographers who focus on storefronts and architecture, the Murrays have captured hundreds of village locales. It is startling how many of these small businesses have been erased from our cityscapes since the Murrays began documenting them. Each of these lost businesses played a vital role in the lives of their neighborhoods. Thankfully, we have James and Carla's imagined images as a record of special times and places. The locales that have been preserved in their beautiful photographs provide an amazing time capsule of mostly late 20th century life in and around the city. A couple whose outstanding efforts in documenting a generation of small businesses and the stories beyond them have brought much needed attention to the plight facing New York City's small businesses. Accepting the Regina Kellerman Award are James and Carla Murray. We first want to thank all the members of Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation who nominated us for this award, and to the selection committee for meeting with us over coffee and attending our jeans walk through the East Village, and ultimately choosing us for this Regina Kellerman Award. We are so greatly honored to receive this recognition. We made it our mission to thoroughly document small, unique mom and pop stores when we first began noticing the alarming rate in which they were all disappearing. Almost two-thirds of the 325 stores that we photographed for our storefront book, which was published in 2008, have already disappeared. And even our New York Knights book, which was more recently published in 2012, 25 stores have already closed. So not only are these modest businesses falling away in the face of modernization and conformity, the once unique appearance and character of our neighborhoods is suffering in the process. In the nearly two decades that we have been documenting these storefronts and recording their oral histories, we learned many things that stuck with us. First of all, we found out the death knell for many of these small shops is when they didn't own the building they were located in and their rent was raised to a level that was uh, unacceptable. It was just to a level they could not afford. And this, sadly, is exactly what happened to the beloved Second Avenue Deli in 2006. Their rent was raised from 24000 a month to 36000 a month. And they were forced to close and a Chase Bank now stands in its place. 
luckily, a few years later, they were, um, they were able to reopen in Midtown. So thankfully, they were able to come back. Love Saves the Day, which one of, that was one of the slides that uh, was up on the screen earlier, was located on the corner of 2nd Avenue and East 7th Street. And that was forced to close in 2009 when their rent was tripled from 5,000 a month to 15,000 a month. Rocco Restaurante on Thompson Street closed in 2011 after being in business for nearly 90 years. The landlord raised the rent from 8,000 a month to 18,000 a month. Bleaker Bob's Records was forced to close in 2012 when its rent doubled from 10,000 a month to 20,000 a month. Jimmy Page, Frank Zappa, both occasionally tended to register there back in the day. On a positive note, we also learned many fascinating facts um, about stores that, thank God, are still in business today. Um, Calvin uh, spoke about McSorley's and kind of took our little punchline away, but what we wanted to say was that it was the last bar in New York City to admit only men, and our fellow um, award recipient, Barbara Shum, was actually the very first woman to be admitted into the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Cafe Reggio on McDougal Street was the first place to introduce cappuccino to the United States. And Venero's um, Pasaceria on East 11th Street, which has been in business since 1894, actually paved the way for the entire neighborhood to get electricity when they petitioned Con Ed to get electricity in East Village rather than it just being in the rich neighborhood of Gramercy. Mark Twain had his prescriptions filled at C.O. Bigelow Apothecaries on 6th Avenue. <laughs> And Matt Newman of Guitars on Bleecker Street, it's been there since 1965, counts Bob Dylan among its famous customers, along with Patti Smith, who calls Matt Newman of Guitars her second home in New York City. KGB Bar on 4th Street in the East Village operated as infamous gangster Lucky Luciano's a speakeasy joint. The Duplex Cabaret and Piano Bar on Christopher Street is the first place where Joan Rivers and Woody Allen ever performed stand-up. <laughs> And Dylan Thomas was a frequent customer of White Horse Tavern, and you can see the photo here. It was actually the last place he had drinks at before he became ill and died in 1953. Photographing busy bars and restaurants in New York City is best done as late as possible and on, on bitter cold nights when it's really uncomfortable. Yeah, and this is exactly how we got this photo. If any of you are familiar with this place, it's usually a mob scene outside with people smoking and just people gathering um, to talk. And when we use a tripod, which we did for the night photographs, it attracted a lot of attention, but we still managed to get the photo. But it was quite cold. It was probably... Yeah, oh. ten, uh, 10 degrees. Yeah. And it was like an episode of Deadliest Catch. I don't know if you guys have ever seen <laughs> that crab fishing show in Alaska. Yeah. Well, that's a, in our minds, we said, <laughs> okay, the only way we're going to get this shot and not have people walk in front of it in constantly is to go there, you know, this and the wind blowing. <laughs> so anyway, um, well, another little, a couple of little other um, gems that we found out. A former mobster's locked safe containing over $2 million in 1928 gold certificates was found by the owners of Theater 80 St. Mark's in the East Village. And no, they didn't get to keep any of the money. Jack Kerouac often got egg creams, which ironically contain neither eggs or cream, at Gem Spa on the corner of 2nd Avenue and St. Mark's Place. John's Italian Restaurant has a mountain of candles in the back room, which have been burning since 1938, celebrating the end of Prohibition. From time to time, the pile gets too high, and Nick has to give it a haircut. Um, that Nick is the owner, and he told us that he goes through approximately 12,000 candles every year. We found it necessary to sometimes wear a bootleg Kane workman's vest and a hard hat and stop and direct traffic around us in order to get a photo in the middle of the street. <laughs> Confidence in acting the park go a long way. Our goal with um, our storefront photographs and stories is to document and help preserve an important part of New York City and bring awareness to maintaining the unique character these businesses add to the streets and neighborhoods of our city. The storefronts have the city's history etched in their facades. They set the pulse, life, and texture of their communities. We want to thank the GBSHP for helping recognize the importance of small businesses in our community and also advocating to help pass legislation to protect them. And we hope that 
it works. Thank you so very much to everyone for this award. <laughs>